Michelle Marsh is an Emmy Award winning journalist in DC. She anchors 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. newscast for WJLA, ABC7, and the Late Night Report at 10 for News Channel 8. She went there from Raleigh, North Carolina, where she spent four years as a morning and noon anchor. And while there, she won two Emmys for breaking news coverage and best newscast. And before that, she worked in Atlanta. Also, um, Binghamton and Albany, after graduating from the Newhouse School, you may have heard of it, <laughs> magna cum laude uh, with a BS in broadcast and digital journalism. So, Michelle, thank you. Hello, Newhouse. <laughs> it's hard to believe it's 2017 and here we are talking about race in media. Um, I can tell you, I had some friends that I talked to before I made the trip up here. I told them I would be talking about race and media, and their reactions were interesting. It pretty much reinforced everything already that I knew to be true. Um, there was hesitation, there was pause, there was a sense of uneasiness, and there was this, oh, you'll be really good at that. And there was also remarks of advice keep it PC. And I think that really speaks to where we are as a society. We still have a tough time wrestling with race. And I think part of the trouble with race is we only talk about it when we're in a crisis. And when I say we, we as Americans. We speak about race when there's a crisis. And when there's a crisis, people are emotional. And when people are emotional, they're usually not good listeners. So everyone goes into their corners, and at the end of the day, not a lot is accomplished. Now you all are entering the world of journalism at a very interesting time. Yes, people still hate talking about race, but also, a lot of people now really hate the media. So welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but as journalists, as you've heard from many of the panelists so far, it's not something that you can avoid. Race is baked into the cake of a lot of stories that you're gonna be sent to cover. Whether it's police-involved shootings or immigration reform, all of these stories require some level of racial sensitivity and awareness. And part of the reason why I'm here today is because I wanna make sure you all are ready for day one. So what I want you to do is take out your cell phones. I know that's not something you hear a lot, in a lecture hall, but I want you to take out your cell phones and I want you to put it on the camera mode. And not filming me, filming <laughs> yourself. So selfie mode. A lot of you probably already had it on selfie mode, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna shoot a quick video and I'm gonna ask a series of questions. These are easy questions, yes or no. Ready, everyone's recording? Okay, so in the last hour, have you had a conversation with someone of another race? In the last week, have you exposed yourself to another culture or learned something about another culture? Yes. And finally, are you building relationships with people, substantial relationships, meaningful relationships, where you're not just talking about the weather or your last class, you're talking about real issues in the world. Are you building relationships with people outside of your race? Now, all of those things I raised because one of the things that I find lacking in a lot of American news, newsrooms is what I call the three C's. And congratulations, you can stop recording. <laughs> uh, you, just, you just completed what I like to call the mirror test 2.0. It's an introspective look at cross-cultural competence. And that is something that I think a lot of newsrooms are lacking these days, cross-cultural competence. And that's an understanding of diverse communities because truly, how can we adequately cover other communities if we don't immerse <coughs> ourselves in them, if we don't understand them? So I often would find, as a journalist, especially beginning my career, where I was the only black reporter, there were no black anchors, there were no black producers, oh, and by the way, management was all white, and also no Latinos, no Hispanics, this was my first job. This was the real world that I entered in. 
I found that a lot of times in editorial meetings, I was the one who had to raise my hand to speak for those who weren't represented at the table. But it's not solely my responsibility as a person of color. Collectively, it is our responsibility as journalists to make sure those voices are heard. Now, talking about journalism is one thing, and I want you all to really know that words matter. And part of cult cross-cultural competence is understanding that words carry weight. Do you call a person an illegal immigrant? Do you call them undocumented? Do you call them an illegal alien? Each of those labels will yield a very different response. So that comes with cross-cultural competence. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of my personal experiences where I not only was writing about race, but I came face to face with race. Case in point, 2015. In 2015, I was a morning anchor in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I was tapped as the first informer for my station to go to South Carolina for the lowering of the Confederate battle flag. <coughs> this was an assignment that I was looking forward to because one of the joys of being a journalist is having a front row seat to history. One of the things that I love about this career. And I went to South Carolina, and I want you to keep in mind, this was in Columbia, but there were a lot of protests, a lot of people who wanted the flag to stay there, those who wanted it to come down. And the month before, if you all recall, before the flag was lowered, nine people were shot down, gunned down, executed inside of a historically black church by a white supremacist. So to say that emotions were raw and tensions were high is an understatement. So I went there, covered the story, and when you cover stories like that, they really stick with you. You remember all the details. I remember how hot it was that day. I remember the people I met, the people I interviewed, the chants of USA as that flag was coming down. And I also recall a group of protesters who wanted that flag to stay there. They had red, white, and blue bandanas, Confederate flags, American flags, signs that I would deem racially insensitive. But I knew, as a journalist, I could not ignore that group. So I went over to them and I talked to them. Their voices were as much a part of that day as those who were there to see that flag lowered. So sometimes covering race, oftentimes covering race, will mean stepping out of your comfort zone, talking to people that may not be happy to see you. Another example of a hostile environment that I've been in was as a reporter in Atlanta. I was sent to a place called Temple, Georgia, outside of Atlanta, about an hour to interview a KKK supporter. I call him a supporter, but he's probably a lot more than a supporter because he often opened up his restaurant for members of the Klan to meet, organize rallies. And the story angle that we were going for was this sign, this road sign that he had placed outside of his restaurant where it included the N-word and it included President Obama's name as well. This was years back when President Obama was in office. And I was assigned to that story. My photographer, also black, we made a pact. One, we'd be out of there before sunset. <laughs> and two, <laughs> two, we would start rolling the camera, start recording the moment I stepped out of that vehicle because we didn't have an appointment with this guy. He didn't know we were coming. And we, quite frankly, didn't know how that day was going to go. And we figured at least if the camera's rolling, we have evidence for whatever might unfold. So again, the story is this road sign that's outside of the restaurant. Some folks had contacted the news station saying, we're appalled by this sign. Um, and they thought we ought to get out there and do something about it. 
So we did, we went out there, we talked to him. And let me tell you, when you walk into that restaurant, I don't know how anyone could eat in there because the decor was sickening. There was a life-size mannequin of a Klan member dressed in a Klan robe with a hood on. How could you eat in that environment is beyond me. And symbols of the Jim Crow era. And this is like recently. This isn't 30, 40 years ago. So I went in there, young journalist. I've got my list of questions. I'm going to ask him some things. And you know what? I'm going to change the way he thinks about black people. And I was wrong. I don't have that power. But when I walked away from that story, I really thought about it. And I realized what power I do have, what power the media does have. And I wondered, were we used in covering that story? Did we enlighten and uncover, or did we inflame? Did we give this man a much larger platform to share hate speech, or did we do something that was necessary? Now, I'm not here to tell you all what I think or make you think what I think. I just want you to think. Where you decide to put the lens of your camera, or the topics you choose to write about, there's power in that. Don't give up your power. You have a platform that can be used to inform. Are you using that platform to inform about issues that are meaningful? Or is it just for clicks? Is it just for shock value? Um, I see my two minute warning. <laughs> um, I want to wrap things up by just saying that um, you definitely want to ask yourselves these questions. And I want to close with a quote from former President George W. Bush. Uh, I love quotes. If you were to go onto my Instagram page, you'll see lots of quotes, pictures of my dog, <laughs> and more quotes and, and food. Um, but <laughs> President George W. Bush said during the opening of the African American Museum of History and Culture, he was speaking about America's long history of race and racism. And he said, a great country does not ignore its history. It does not hide its history. It faces its flaws and it corrects them. I believe that the same can be said about journalism. We should not hide our history of tokenism, of <coughs> silencing marginalized voices, of um, of reinforcing stereotypes. Instead, we ought to face those flaws and figure out how we can correct them. Just think all of you can be part of the solution. Thank you for your time. Thank you.